Good evening, friends. We have put up the second case now for discussion. Uh, and it shouldn't end up being just a discussion of the images, which because we don't treat images, the patient as a whole has to be understood. Now, this was uh, a 55-year lady with that had presented with dysphagia, uh, which was worsening dysphagia for the last 25 days. And history is very important in these patients. And don't jump to a CT scan or the X-rays or the barium studies. First, take a good history. Uh, patient doesn't give any history of cancer in the family. She had a hysterectomy some years ago. Uh, and a patient who's, um, who's come with dysphagia, you need to take history of any ingestion of corrosives or any intervention in the past or any history of reflux disease, which is important. And uh, there is also uh, a relevance, especially in this part of the world, to take a good history of tuberculosis, which although unusual in the West, is not so rare in this part of the world. And secondly, remember, esophagus, like any other tube, has obstruction due to causes within the lumen, causes in the wall, and causes outside the wall. So we have entities with our, which, that are inside and those that are in the wall, which is in the form of strictures. And outside it could be many, uh, like we have the, the webs, the aberrant vessels, uh, we have the lymph nodes uh, that can cause the paraesophageal lymph nodes are, or parapretracheal lymph nodes, thyroid malignancies, uh, and also any other malignancies that can press it from outside. So like any other tube, that would be the picture. So one should not just jump to uh, diagnosing them as cancers or echelasia cardia or, uh, you know, something nasty without finding out the history. It's important to find out which part of the country they are from. Uh, this is common in the northeast and also uh, is common in the, the countries like Japan, where that's why you have uh, most of the you know, important studies and articles published from Japan on esophagus. And they are specialists in three-stage surgery for this, three-field surgery for esophagus. Uh, the, the books on esophagus by Akiya, Mataka, Hashi, etc. That's why they're popular. That's where the disease is more common. That's cancer esophagus. So I wanted to give that detour so that you understand that it's not just the x-ray. I'll come to that later. So essentially, there was a request also from some students for dysphagia class. So I would be more interested in uh, a good history. There is very little to examine and uh, the and then i'll have the investigation so one sh one shouldn't jump to investigation straight away it should be a good history and examination of especially the cervical area for any lymph nodes abdomen for you know same old system t for t for n and for m and history also for t for n for m so, for T, you take the history of how big the tumor is, how fast it's growing. Esophagus, unfortunately, has a very narrow lumen. So, the manifestation is usually dysphagia. Now, I'll come back to dysphagia again, and I'll keep coming back off and on as I go. Uh, look for, so we, we cannot really examine for T, because it's not an accessible part, and one is usually relying on indirect evidence to make a diagnosis and therefore a good history is paramount. So what history would I take? I'll come here later. First of all, for how long does he have it? So duration. Whether it is for solids, I mean to liquids and solids, what do you have the dysphagia for? We all know that initially for any mechanical obstruction, mechanical I'm saying, for any mechanical obstruction, initially the obstruct the dysphagia is to solids, and later on it will be to liquids, and then it will be a complete dysphagia, and that's no rocket science. It is gradually the narrowing that is happening. It is getting compressed or filled. So initially, this time. Solids are a problem, liquid can go, then even liquids are a problem, and then finally there is a complete obstruction. So this is how it will 
worsen. Accordingly, therefore, the history would be initially the patient would say, I had no problem taking uh, liquids. Then I had problem taking even liquids and then now there is a complete obstruction and I am not able to take it. And one should not confuse it with odinophagia, which is painful swallowing that can happen due to inflammatory conditions also. And they, even dysphagia can happen due to inflammatory conditions. But if it happens due to inflammatory conditions, there will be features like pain and other symptoms which produce, which are found in inflammatory uh, disorders. Now, so duration is important and uh, its pattern is important, which we've just handled to solids or to liquids. Now, if there is uh, dysphagia to liquids first and solids don't produce dysphagia, naturally you're looking at not a mechanical cause, right? This was mechanical. This is not mechanical. So this would be some sort of a neurogenic uh, factor. That is, uh, if it's a light object, it will be blocked and solid by virtue of its weight will go down. And this history becomes extremely important to make a diagnosis of echelasia cardia. Well, so that's an important cause of dysphagia, which shouldn't exclude, should must be excluded, and history has to be therefore meticulously taken. Then more things. There are conditions where uh, there is a dysphagia due to narrowing. Uh, if there is an atresia, which happens, sort of like any tube, the obstruction or the dysphagia could be due to some congenital causes also, which I didn't cover here because. It was not directly relevant, but that will complete the long list, so I just take it. Congenital naturally is atresia. And this would usually happen with uh, TO fistula or there are various types. We are not going there. That's congenital. The other is acquired. Naturally, it happens later. It the, here the baby is born with it and there is a surgery done and there is there is a system of testing by using the uh, the, naso, uh, the nasogastric tube to lo look for the distance and there are various types whether it could be high fistula atresia here it could be low one with a connection above so this a separate this is a separate topic but you should know about the congenital causes and in acquired causes you have as I've mentioned a few, you have benign causes and malignant causes, which is, of course, more of a case here. Benign can be, <coughs> I've already described a few. So to repeat it, it can be like Plummer, Vincent syndrome, many things, webs, right, which are in the neck, anomalies like you can have a you know, uh, you can have a large aberrant subclavian artery which applies pressure from outside. And then, of course, there can be inflammatory conditions like esophagitis or reflux esophagitis, which, like inflammation, heals by fibrosis, any inflammation, and leads to stricture. Then you have... Uh, other conditions like now strictures, congenital strictures we already covered, acquired can happen following corrosive poisoning. That's why that has to become important. So corrosive poisoning or they can be traumatic, post-traumatic, post-trauma. That is, you've done an endoscopy, so this could be iatrogenic and you've caused a damage. Or in trauma, there is an injury to the esophagus which has healed by uh, fibrosis can produce stricture or there can be uh, some parasitic infections, trypanosoma cruzi, which produces Chagas disease. I'm sure you remember that just to complete the list. 
that's also a cause. So there's so many benign causes, so you can't just jump to malignancy straight away. Although, or on the side of looking for malignancy, you need to exclude it. Exactly, it is exactly on the lines of breast disorders where you need to exclude malignancy. So that's the history part. I've covered most of it. Uh, there could be some parts remaining, and you can always fall back on the logic which I gave you. There is a tube which can have a problem inside. So in the lumen, in the wall, or outside the wall. In the lumen, foreign body, growth, right, polyp, etc. In the wall, strictures, which could be congenital and acquired. Congenital, I've already covered separately. Acquired strictures can be post injury, which includes even corrosive injury or iatrogenic trauma, as I said, or they can be inflammatory, post inflammation, which could be esophagitis, right? They could be mm, related to. Um, any, any, in fact, inflammation and part that I've already covered. Congenital and acquired. So, strictures will come in here. And of course, the important one, that is malignancy. Malignant stricture. Now, outside, it can be a lymph node. We've talked about the, you know, there is a term called as globus hystericus which is seen in young girls who have an element of a, like a ball in the throat. But they have also got dysphagia. So there are just so many causes. I tried my best to recollect and put as many as I could. But importantly, the two major conditions that we look at are echalasia cardia and malignancy. And they're, they're the ones that you need to look at carefully. As I mentioned, in any mechanical obstruction, especially malignancy or any mechanical obstruction, it will be solids, then liquids, and then complete. This is mechanical obstruction. In neurogenic obstruction like achalasia, we'll have liquids first. Then, of course, solids almost never happens. So by that time, the patient would manifest. And classically, especially in echalasia, it goes down like you have a narrow beak type of appearance here, which actually looks like a bird beak appearance. Anyway, while the benign strictures are short, and there is no irregularity that you'll observe. In a malignant stricture, there is usually shouldering and they are irregular and they end up in a thin, narrow, long stricture. That's why that looks like a rat tail. So, looks like a back of a rat. And that too, a rat which is not too happy at the back, it has been rogered. You can see this irregular. It's a bat with a rat that has been hit on the back, you can see. So, rat tail appearance with the back of the rat having been rogered. Okay, easy to remember. So, if you have a patient with dysphagia, take a good history and don't miss it. You need to then examine carefully for, basically as I said, looking for an obvious cause which may be rare. Like you have a big thyroid, you have a big thyroid, or you have a big neck lesion of any kind. So, there's an obvious cause. So, these are obvious reasons which don't demand any attention or effort. You can look for them. And then the second thing is look for cervical lymph nodes, which indicate some malignancy. And then finally, you will look for the third part, which is the M part. 
here and that will be for metastasis. So, distant metastasis or metastasis to the lymph nodes, this, this is what you look for. So, we look for T, we have looked for N, T mostly is 90% history because you will have very little, only 10% findings on examination. And looking for nodes, you need to examine neck, abdomen, for M, look for liver. And remember, if there is a lymph node in the abdomen for a cervical esophagus, that will be taken as metastatic disease. So it should be the regional node that we are looking at. So this should be a regional nodes. It shouldn't be non-regional node because non-regional node is a different staging. I'm just touching the dysphagia and I've kept it short for this purpose. So it may not be a complete uh, mm, complete description of the whole thing. Now I think we can then look at what do we do. We have a case of dysphagia with the history that we have just provided. You'll do investigations to confirm diagnosis to stage the disease and to treat the patient. Now, what can you do to confirm the disease? This, this is a tricky scenario. After you've taken a good history, uh, don't confuse the patient and don't tell the patient that you've got something nasty. Now, most people have a doubt here whether you do imaging or you do contrast. I mean, including this, sorry, or you do endoscopy. Right, it's a commonly asked question. Imaging would be some contrast, so it includes contrast. And endoscopy is to actually get the biopsy, because without that, how do you confirm your diagnosis? So when you're dividing it, be flexible in answering. And say that I would like to prefer to do the imaging and then follow it up with um, basically endoscopy. But the issue with imaging is most of us would order a barium swallow. Now, barium swallow, as is given here, is a very useful investigation. It is able to give you an impression of a cancer or it rules out an echelasia or it rules out a malignancy. Once that is done, the only problem is if you follow it up with uh, upper GI or you follow it up with endoscopy or esophagoscopy, the barium has to be clear. Otherwise, it may turn out to be a whitewash. You may see all white because barium takes a while to go. It may line up the mucosa and you may have a difficulty. Although it's not such a real problem because you can always, these days we use a very thin barium. And the problem in these patients is since there is obstruction here, it piles up and it may take a while to go. So a lot of people are not truly very happy doing the barium swallow first. But without barium swallow, I mean, you should, in principle, always do a non-invasive test first so that you don't end up doing endoscopy and finding nothing in the esophagus and it is outside the esophagus. There's a good case for doing, uh, depending on where it is, ultrasound saying the neck is all right, ultrasound of the abdomen is also important to look for any. Uh, the status of the liver lymph nodes and in this case the she's had hysterectomy so look for any ascites and uh, the peritoneal or the as they call it the pouch of douglas for any deposits and the peritoneum any deposits so you can do imaging imaging can you do contrast in a ct scan a lot of people like to do that straight away which is more specific and it's able to show the thorax also along with it. And it depends where the esophagus is. Most of us have actually got barium swallow done beforehand. And let's face it, in this case, the same situation. 
you have a barium swallow here and you should describe it as a barium swallow where classically there is a structure that's long and this part is also narrow usually you find peristalsis uh, which is but short segments this is a long segment and you can see there is a rat tail appearance and this is classical for this especially is the rat tail appearance and if you notice it isn't looking like a regular uh, margin here it's irregular this being an elderly lady with a short history i would suspect it to be malignant and even in an x-ray that comes along you can look at the lung for any metastasis or any effusion which can help you make a diagnosis so barium we had just given you this barium to study and assess but i have discussed with you the uh, the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis because we don't treat the images so for the metastasis you can do a ultrasound abdomen ct thorax which i have mentioned here which you can see also <coughs> and uh, finally of course we will have a diagnosis when we do the endoscopy which will let us know as to what is the type grade whether there is malignancy firstly then the type the grade and accordingly this will help us and also there can be some uh, multiple lesions synchronous and the most important thing that you can do is which you're doing is a biopsy and then that, that can give you this information based on that you would plan the management and naturally this is a case with a mid segment malignancy which is becoming more common uh, uh, it used to be uh, the more common in the west we always had the lower part getting involved more and especially the g junction close by it is a different cancer this would be addressed as a so therefore it will be discussed as a uh, case of dysphagia which is probably malignant uh, suggesting carcinoma of the esophagus and therefore we need to investigate on those lines and once you've done this and once you've staged it you have options to put these patients on some kind of i mean they need more investigation this dysphagia needs to be managed and if it is resectable the approach could be different in the upper one third broadly it's uh, radiations in the low one third uh, it is mostly since it is almost on the lines of stomach we can we offer surgery and it's amenable to trans hiatal esophagectomy the mid one third we generally have a combination of both and you can use the Iver Lewis approach which allows you to go through the thorax resect and then we make a tube out of stomach and uh, we can pull it up in an estomose in a classical transfer transhiatal approach i'm not discussing the lymph node dissection which is two field versus three field the japanese like to do three field where actually the entire gr all groups are removed including the carinal nodes and the cervical lymph nodes also and the the paraesophageal nodes here so that's beyond the scope of this but you should understand that there are various options for surgery in this case a lot of people like to do a transhiatal esophagectomy where we have an abdominal approach through which you dissect out the stomach properly and then we have since we have to we also try and dissect at the uh, esophago cardiac junction and to see the to assess through the crust the excess that we are going to have towards the growth and then finally we have a stomach tube cut out which is based on the gastroepiploic pedicle rather than left gastric is ligated and then we make a tube out of this now the dotted part the dotted part joints is go is taken out along with the esophagus right 
just to show you. This part is going, so this is the part which will be uh, used for making the tube and we will do some bit of jug ready to make it as long as we can and this requires cockerization which will lengthen the uh, the this will mobilize the duodenum and also as you pull it this is pylorus a lot of people like to make it incompetent because this is now going to work like uh, yes so it is pulled up and pylorus comes to lie somewhere here and this tube goes up into the uh, neck and what do you do the once you've done this part you can go to the next step the yellow thing is what we are indicating as the malignancy the malignancy is we mobilize usually the lower growths are amenable and they are easier to remove we clear it off and we have to be careful about pericardium the pleura and the azygous vein which crosses over it can it can actually bleed and the process is quite blind which is why a lot of people don't recommend it. I will use as an advantage that you open up the thorax and you do it under vision and you can actually clear up the lymph nodes along with that. In this technique the lymph node clearance may not be as good. A lot of us like to put a scope in and see and do it under vision. So it is possible to do that. It, it, may, it becomes less blind if you use, if you do a scope assisted trans hiatal esophagectomy and so you've dissected it this segment is all free that means and then we have an approach in the neck what do we do in the neck we have the patient's position in the same position we make an incision hockey stick in front of the uh, sternomastoid and like you do for thyroid but we extend it upwards you deepen it go in between the strap muscles and the thyroid actually so you ligate whatever you can and you reach then you reach trachea and on the left side it is low below and I mean you can all you can share we'll share with you the video of the procedure so it will be easier we dissect it take it on a tape and then dissect from above from below so above below and above both and finally we disconnect it here and what we do is at this end we usually leave a long uh, nasogastric tube tied to it so it goes in or earlier I was using just a thread a long thread tied to it and then what do we do we have this end is to go we've already disconnected it this is the disconnected part it is at the end when you have tied it you got a long suture here also so this goes it's taken out through the neck I mean this has to go here so I'll just show you again in this picture so we have esophagus transected here and we have this is the esophagus and the part of the stomach that we have to remove so once we have mobilized and disconnected it we have got this disconnected we make sure that it's clear and we deliver it out and this tube that I have tied with it or the thread comes down with it so in the next picture you will see that the esophagus is the whole thing has come down and we still have the the thread here which is hanging which is connected upwards the thread is still connected in the neck so we remove this part and tie the tube that we have newly created to to the thread and pull it up in the neck and once we have pulled it up in the neck the anastomosis is done between the cervical esophagus and the newly created tube which I'll draw with the blue now there are many finer points in this this is all connected and spirals would be somewhere here as you see and we got this going down like this so the, this is the erstwhile stomach 
which is a tube that is based on gastroepiploic vessel. So it is based on gastroepiploic pedal, pedicle which was here. So basically we remove this part after disconnecting from here but at this end it can be long, otherwise it is very cumbersome to pull it up. So it comes down with it and then we tie that thread to the tube and pull the tube up in the neck and in the neck we do an anastomosis, leave a drain there, abdomen is closed and that is the transhiatal esophagectomy. In an Ivor Lewis we have a thoracic incision, thoracotomy is done after laparotomy. Right, so we 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 can I mean we make the same tube, okay, and the resection is done the same way. We resect it, clear up the nodes. So that is an advantage, right up to the I mean where the recurrents are going up. You clear along the recurrent laryngeal nerve. That's what they the Japanese want to do. Then they do the resection in the neck. So the entire this is that that is what makes it one, two, and three field. So they clear off all the lymph nodes, and then we can anastomose in the thorax. So in Ivor Lewis, where is the anastomosis made in the thorax? So it is suitable for mid thorax. Transhiatally suitable for lower one third. I have briefly touched on the procedure. Of course, it's very difficult to make the whole thing uh, cleared without assisting and maybe I'll share with you my video on esophageal, esophageal cancer surgeries that we have done. And then we leave a drain in the abdomen. Here we need a tube thoracostomy and uh, we need to drain the thorax. Where is it gone? Here. So this needs a tube afterwards. It has a risk. What is the risk? It's very obvious. It can leak in here. The problem with the transhiatal is if at all the leak happens, it is in the neck. And the, if the tube is made well, it is a very useful procedure and we find it most useful and we have used it the maximum. And up to mid esophagus, we can actually use our fingers to break it. That is the only problem with it. Since we, we have used scope, it becomes easier to go high and you can see all the vessels because the vessels are feeding directly from aorta into the esophagus. And, you can clip them under vision, that makes it much better. And like I mentioned in the beginning, azygous, azygous means it has no pair, right? Azygous is a single vein that crosses over and it can, if it is damaged, it is torrential hemorrhage. And the other complication is pleurized rupture, the pneumothorax, so leave a tube there. And pericardial rupture can be a problem and the, the, these, uh, the veins also relating to heart can be an issue. So, we have advantages and disadvantages of both. Most people would do transhiatal. The most common ca most common site that we observe in Indian scenarios is low one third. Although it is changing, it is getting higher uh, even in this subcontinent. You know the reason why they, they they don't actually know it earlier it was attached to reflux esophagitis in this part of the world. A lot of us know H. pylori is a factor too, but one doesn't know exactly. It is related to many factors and it is a cancer where mostly we were earlier not thinking of cure and 5 year survival rate was less than 20 percent. It is just a dysphagia that was treated by the surgery and a lot of these patients would not live beyond 2 years or 3 years or 4 years. It is also one of the champions of the army of death as they say. So it improved with the neoadjuvant chemotherapy coming into vogue and the new urgent chemotherapy can actually make the dysphagia better and the outcome of surgery better and the survival rates have improved. So this is one cancer where survival rates have improved with new urgent chemotherapy and surgery alone if you are asked a question is to basically was earlier th taken to be to treat dysphagia. Although it is changed with the Japanese but they get their cancers early and that is why they are able to do a better job. They also do endoscopic mucosal resection where they can, on screening, they find it. They can do it by instilling saline under this submucosal plane. It rises and then you can just chisel it off. And this is one scenario where endoscopic ultrasound is extremely useful to make a diagnosis in early cancer. 
and in in some sort of a screening happening, especially in, in that part of the world, they've been able to pick up those early cancers. Barring that, most of the time, by the time you make a diagnosis, and if there is dysphagia, naturally there is obstruction and the growth is already, it is not early. So we don't get to see early cancers. And if you get a growth, say, in the low one-third of esophagus with a node in the cervical region, you're only looking at a metastatic or distant disease. So one has to be extremely, extremely positive in dealing with it and counsel the patient accordingly because they really suffer. There's a lot of cachexia in this pa these patients and many a times the best approach is as they come to do a feeding gymnostomy and put them on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, look for a good response and the response is assessed in terms of relief and dysphagia and also one can do a imaging whether it's contrast and CT scan uh, or more advanced procedures. In the role of PET scan, one is not too sure. Now, feeding J, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then maybe you can do sal surgery. But there are options which I have just discussed with you. They need to be exercised depending upon what you do. One complication of transhiatal esophagectomy, which I did mention, was in the neck there can be a leak, and that is a disaster, which then would need, you need to put a good drain. And often this tube is devascularized, and that again leads to a leak into the mediastinum, which causes mediastinitis, another high mortality complication. But the cervical leak, have, leak would have to be managed by taking the esophagus out, which is called esophagostomy, and doing a feeding gymnostomy to disconnect it completely. So that's the long and short of it. A case of dysphagia, which looks very much like malignancy, with based on the history, with the points in history are short history, quickly, rapidly progressing dysphagia. And on examination, there's nothing per se. Patient is cachexic, and the performance status has dropped. Nutritionally, the patient is weak. And barium swallow is suggestive, so we should go in for an endoscopic biopsy, which would establish a diagnosis, and it doesn't look early. So it would be a good case to do a feeding gymnostomy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and planning it. And always answer that we'll discuss this case in the MDT, which we'll be doing next Tuesday, and take a call on this case. Thank you very much.